This is the virtual job shadow where you guys are gonna spend all day with us and see what goes on. Kind of a fly on the wall, the full experience, no, nothing left unturned. We had seven page script that we had to shoot in one day with um, an entire production team we had never worked with before. All right, film with the Aquabats. Um, Zane and I are co-directing, so we're working together as a team in unison um, on a production and people we've never worked with before. So it's a new experience, but we're coming together and we're just dialing the script to make sure everything flows. We have seven pages that we're shooting today, which is a lot for most movies. They shoot about three pages a day, give or take. Seven full pages, mind you. So we're gonna see how it goes and just um, we start shooting about 15, 20 minutes from now. So the pressure's on. So our two co-directors for the day, you guys are gonna be learning from them. Look at the slate. Has our name on it. Ooh. Most films, even in the Hollywood world, most of them film about three pages a day. That's pretty standard, typical, either on student productions to the big Hollywood productions, three pages a day, which every page equals on screen time about a minute, give or take. Seven pages is what we had to film in one day. And it had a lot of gags, it had a lot of stunt work, it had a lot of extras, 40 plus extras. So to make something like this happen on a, on a location we've never been to before, a lot of stuff had to happen so we could be as prepared as possible, but also run as smoothly as possible as well. So we're gonna kind of share what we learned, how to work efficiently, fast, on time, and on budget. Yeah. So a part of it too was we show you a lot of stuff like while you are while we are actually on set, we talked to the camera um, quite a bit to explain what we're doing and why we're doing it. But because of how tight the deadline was and how much we had to work, we weren't able to um, talk as much to the camera as we would like. So we're gonna kind of review a little bit of some of the footage you'll see and explain why we were doing certain things. We gotta work with the Aquabats. They're one of like my childhood rock stars growing up. Like I listened to ska music, their music, on the radio while in high school. So for me, this was a big deal to work with them and they have their own TV show. They just launched their own Kickstarter. They got it funded. So that was essentially funding this project. We were directing this project for completely free. We were doing this because of the passion and we knew it would be a really awesome opportunity to share with you guys as far as that learning experience and what that looked like. So we were gonna be working with the Aquabats and also Napoleon Dynamite himself, John Heater, he's the actor that played it. Something tells me this is gonna be an epic battle between two equally skilled opponents. So for us, this was a big deal to work with people that are actually in the Hollywood business. The Aquabats have had several seasons on national television. So we were filming essentially the, the third next installment for their series and they're used to doing TV production. So we got to see that firsthand as well. So, and, and we're also going to talk about, cause they had the guest star of John Heater and Devin and I, we've worked with one other Hollywood star before which was Gaten from Stranger Things. But this was John Heater on a different level. And talking about that, now there is, it's easy to get nervous um, around those types of things because you feel like, oh, who am I to, to direct these people? But you'll find out quickly, and it's something that to, to take in consideration, they're just people. They're just normal people, and they're happy to listen, and they want to contribute. And so John was super awesome to work with, as well as, uh, as the rest of the Aquabats, who they've had tons of experience and worked with several different directors. But they were awesome at giving us their full attention. And Devin and I, um, I think we were prepared enough when we went in there that we were confident in what we were doing, which I think confidence is a huge key. Steven Spielberg on his HBO special and when he first started directing was given some advice. And that was, even if you don't know what you're doing, act like you know what you're doing. And um, just be confident and come up with a plan so you do have that moral authority and you do have that confidence. And then the actors will just trust you more. And then you'll be able to pull off things quickly, efficiently. And that being said, let's go ahead and dive right in, Devin, to some of the things that we learned and some of the things that we can help teach you guys. Now, just to elaborate on what Zane was just talking about as far as fake it till you make it, as a director, you are leading the set. You're gonna be the sole pusher. At the end of the day, you're responsible for telling the story. Now, there are a lot of times where you're not gonna know what the exact answer is or the right answer. Not necessarily the right answer because there's always a lot of right answers, but the best answer. Now that's what's so great about directing is you also have a ton of what's called department heads. People that are in charge of certain things as far as it's their role to kind of take ownership of that. So on this project, we had a director of photography. We had a costume designer, set builders. Like we had all these different people that were in charge of their 
own um, things they're overlooking. So whenever you have the opportunity to work with these people, use them the best you can. So in our case, our director of photography, he's done a ton of commercials, he knows his stuff, but he'd been working on the Aquabat episodes ever since the beginning. He shot every single one of them. So he was a great source as far as someone that we could trust. We could bounce off of ideas. Because when we go into a show as directors, we don't want to say, well, we're going to change the whole show. And we, we don't want to um, alienate the audience. We want it to still feel fresh, but also still feel consistent with what's already been created from the beginning. Now, Jeff is also used to filming everything as pretty and as cinematic as possible, but because this was a TV show, he even said at the beginning, like, we have a budget that we have to work on, it's comedy, it's a kid's show, and I, we have to shoot this different than how I would a traditional, like, drama piece. So he was like, a lot of times we have to rush through things, I can't make the shots look as pretty as possible with lighting. So he even said, like, all the rules I had been taught going into this, I had to break all of them and do all the things I've always disagreed with. So Jeff knew exactly how the show has been filmed before, so we were constantly bouncing off different ideas with him But what was cool to hear from Jeff is he was really excited to work with a different director Because he thought it would help freshen up the series and that we'd be able to bring something new to the table So me coming from a lot of camera backgrounds we We're adding a lot of different camera moves that they had never done on their shows because they're never they're not used to having moving camera shots Everything's used to being locked off a um, couple cameras when they can but a lot of the shots that we were kind of bringing to the table Were kind of the things we're known for is as far as those glide cam those dolly like shots Which I think helped tell the story that much better. Jeff was amazing as a DP, but we also had a ton of different positions as well. We had all the, the we had like the first AC and the first AD, which we've had in other shoots, but these are guys that we have never worked with before. And having those was like such a huge help in being able to hammer out these seven pages as quickly as possible. Without them, it would have been a nightmare. They were also experienced enough that they knew how things should, should run and they took care of like if there were people who were not part of the shoot were coming into set, they would take care of that. They were also um, quick to quick to wrangle all the actors, um, which we'll talk about as well on this video about talking about wrangling actors as a director. And uh, so that, that was a, such a huge help in, and if you can have those positions, it's so much better and things will work way more efficiently. But keep in mind too, that there is the stigma that when you do have a lot of people, it is, it, the set does become automatically more chaotic. And we talked a little bit about this on set, but when you're the director, everyone's gonna come to you and everyone wants an answer. So, as far as working with other departments, a lot of people come up to you and have a lot of questions and you need to have answers. So, um, people will even ask like, what tie, what color tie, you know, whatever, and you just gotta give an answer. Even if you change your mind later, it's because you gotta get things moving. So, um, just be prepared for that when you get on set, that a lot of people are going to be instantly asking you, okay, where can I set this up? Where can I go and set this up? Where can I set this up? And it also helps to have a great producer or even a unit production manager to kind of help that as well. But you're going to get bombarded with uh, from every department and you just need to be ready to respond. And that's just that nature of the beast. If you feel like you're getting overwhelmed or bombarded, um, you got to get used to that as a director because that's just the nature of the beast. People are gonna to come to you. And also, but having those department heads is gonna make your job a whole lot easier. Now, on some of the other productions that Devin and Devin and I have been a part of, it's been more run and gun and less crew. And so you're kind of taking on, you're wearing a lot of different hats and having to be those, making those decisions by yourself anyways. But having the other people in charge, man, it helps you focus on the script, helps you focus on telling the story. If you can, have those different department heads and that will make your life so much easier. We also wanna talk about... Well, one thing to add to that. Yeah. Right? So, talking about this shoot, the Aquabat shoot, the departments that we work with the most, um, I would say were wardrobe, um, the director of photography, and also the set designer slash builder. So how do those relationships exactly work? So as far as wardrobe goes, they'd already kind of figured out the wardrobe before we even got there. So we, we didn't have a ton of stuff to go over. There's just a couple little things, little tweaks, but nothing crazy intense. As far as set designing, right when we got there, they were starting to build the set, but they were asking for our suggestions on where we thought the set should actually be as far as the stage where the Aquabats were gonna be performing. And one of the big questions was, is do we make the set two feet tall or do we make it one one foot tall. Now the problem was, is we we're filming with a big branded store. If we had the set higher, we were going to actually see the logos and we had to avoid the logo. So we decided to have a set that was smaller. That was Zane and I making those decisions. Another big decision, and I mean, not necessarily a big decision, but a decision we were asked from the production designer is he brought two different easels and he was like, would you prefer us to use this easel, which is more of kind of like an A-frame or more of this kind of easel, which is more kind of a square and blocky one. We ended up going with the more A-frame one. So those are just decisions that the department heads are bringing to us. And within minutes, if not less, we have to figure that out, get that dialed in. 
But without question, when it comes time to filming, when it comes time to actually making the movie on location, the director of the photography is the person you're gonna be dealing with the most. Now, the other department heads, you're gonna be dealing with them a ton, but that's usually before you start filming, all the pre-production. But on our cases, Jeff, the director of photography, is the person that we were dealing with the most because that was the time where it was go time and that's when Jeff is being used or utilized the most. So just keep that in mind when you are creating these projects, this content. As director of photography, like you need to be best friends with him um, or her. You need to have a really good relationship. And on all big Hollywood movies, it's the director that most of the time is always choosing the director of photography because they both have to speak the same language. Steven Spielberg, he's been using the same director of photography for the last 15, 20 years plus. So you, they definitely form a, re, a friendship, a relationship, and they both understand each other's lingos so they can work together. And everything on set, guys, is about being as, as fast and efficient as possible. Like Devin's saying, it's choosing your director of photography. Now, one, you want to look at their work. You want to see what they do, how they like things, and see how adaptable they are. Now, you'll hear a lot of stories, like even on big Hollywood sets, where the director of photography and the director kind of butt heads a little bit. But choosing someone that you feel like comfortable working with, and once you find that, that person, um, it's kind of good to use them, to keep on using them, because like Devin said, you'll speak the same language, you guys will understand each other, almost reading each other's minds, and that will just cause the whole production to move faster. I, let's play around with the snap zoom. Okay, I love it. At least for the first couple. Yeah. Boom, boom. Boom, like almost awesome. like three of them. So snap in and then come back out and then snap in or snap in like a little bit each time? Each time you get a little bit closer, a little bit closer, a little bit closer. Love it. <laughs> so guys, we're just getting set up now um, and then Jeff will probably be just for the, like the opening establishing shot. Rad. Really far back. Um, do you want to go still stay on the ladder maybe? Do a high, um, high wide on that or just this Whatever you prefer, I'm fine with either one. Cool, love it. And to move faster, it means that's one more opportunity to get another shot and that's everything. So keep that in mind, guys, as you are looking for your director of photography. Now, as a director, the ideal goal is you'll continue to work with whoever as many times as possible. So you want to make sure that you're doing their job the best as you can, but it's also important that you're pleasing the person that's paying the paycheck. In this case, there wasn't a paycheck, but the person you're normally trying to please is the producer, the person that's overseeing the whole project, the producers and the creators. So in this case, there was a guy named Jason. Boom! Boom! Now Jason, he is one of the, the co-creators of the Aquabats. He normally directs most of the shows. He's probably directing 95% of the shows. He was on set with us the entire time. So he knew the Aquabats better than anyone else there besides the Aquabats. Um, but when, whenever the opportunity arose where we could ask for Jason's feedback or opinion on different things, we tried to have him involved with it just because he did understand the show and he was open to new ideas. So it made it really fun and easy to work with, but it's just also being aware of the people you actually need feedback from to make it the best it can be. Oh. And it may help sell it a little bit more from a little more in front of him. I think so. Okay, yeah, the yeah. side yeah. What? might be where we're missing. Sorry, I'm just gonna get in front of you a little bit more. I think it'll help sell it. Here we go, so rolling. Please. <laughs> Three, two, one, boom. Boom! 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 All right, we got it! Okay. Yeah. Let's go. But Jason and also um, Christian, he's the main um, singer of the Aquabats, the Bat Commander as they call him. Okay. So we're kind of shooting our looks out towards camera this way when yep. we're on the run. And then all of a sudden he's just going to come, the second you finish yep. your line, mm -hmm. he's going to come jumping in. Perfect! Yeah! I can't wait to do this again! Let's go! Oh my leg! Hold on, cramp! Hey. They're both creators of the actual TV show, um, so their opinions were um, much more valid than, let's just say, like a, a couple extras that showed up on set. So it's also being aware of, um, even though they're not necessarily fully department heads, but who is in charge of the show overall as far as carrying that vision and staying consistent with that, we wanted to make sure we were all on the same page working together. So another thing that's super important on a set is problem solving. You will always run into problems. So. Oftentimes, you will be all of a sudden given uh, a curveball and you have to be quick on your feet and figure out where you're going to take the loss. Um, so one, one specific example was our main bad guy. We didn't know this until we got on set. He had to leave early, so we didn't have him the whole day and we thought that we did. Hey. Oh, don't be out of bubblegum. Do and not be out of bubblegum. out of bubblegum. Oh, God. Ah! 
we, we try to do the whole shoot in order from page one, you know, to the last page, page seven. But because we learned this news that the bad guy was having to leave early, that means we needed to get all of his stuff hammered out beforehand. So that means like, we just gotta make sure that we get all the coverage that we need and as quick, and doing it all efficiently and as quickly as possible. So another curveball that we were thrown is we had to wrap off the main bad guy by 4.30. But then all of a sudden around three o'clock an ambulance comes and we were told, hey, this is another scene in the video for the next episode that you need to film for this episode. We have to shoot it before we lose the bad guy and ideally we shoot it as quick as possible because you're paying $80 an hour as far as the production. So we're actually shooting part of the next episode right now. So this isn't even going in our episode. So we're kind of- Coming back. So we're just kind of working with every situation that we're thrown into. Um, we found out kind of in the middle of filming, oh, you actually got to film the scene right now. So we have to stop the other stuff that we're filming. So it kind of kills the momentum. We have two hours left of sun and we have about four pages left of filming. So we're kind of screwed right now, but we'll see what happens. We gotta make it work no matter what, so that means we're gonna have to start cutting out a lot of the shots that we want. I'm even taking the time right now to do this interview for you guys, but I'm under a lot of stress now, and at the end of the day, if the story's not told, that's on my shoulders. So the pressure's on, bring it on. And we were in the middle right then filming with John Heater, um, big actor, and we wanted to be respectful of his time, so it's like, how do we balance the ambulance, the bad guy leaving, also John Heater's time, and also trying to tell our story in a consistent order so it all makes sense and no one kind of loses that vision. So you're constantly being thrown curveballs, and a lot of times it's like, okay, I, I don't know how we can make this work, it's physically impossible to make it work, but somehow you have to make it work. So it's just being willing to be adaptable. If you're set on a set schedule, it's like it has to run exactly this way, you probably aren't gonna be as successful in filmmaking if you're not willing to change and adapt because sometimes the weather is gonna change drastically. All of a sudden you're gonna have a big bus that shows up, which we had several times and we had to constantly change and adapt. We were constantly changing and adapting just for the sun. As far as where the sun was hitting the bus, it was bringing too much light on certain actors. So we had to shift uh, entire sequences um, or scenes because the lighting was changing. It wasn't what we had planned on, but we were having to adapt constantly on our feet and pretending the whole time as if it was completely planned because we were the ones leading the charge and making it look like there was no chaos. It was all put together and all calculated. Mm -hmm. So fake it till you make it. Yeah, and don't beat yourself up either. That's if uh, when you start getting on set and your first time directing, if things go wrong, because that's just the nature of the beast. Things will go wrong on a film set. Um, everyone knows it. Ron Howard talks about that he had an advantage because when he, he's been you know working in the business since he was a child, and so he was very aware that problems take place on sets. So you just gotta be ready for it. And if you can conquer it, and if you can come up with those solutions uh, by working with all the people, don't just think you have to take it upon yourself as a director, but work with everyone, work and, and talk ideas, and, but also keep a positive attitude, then you will find that you're just gonna have such a better time on set. Uh, people are more willing to work harder because they're in good moods. So, but just be aware and don't beat yourself up when problems do arrive on set, because they will. Which leads us to our next section, which we're gonna talk about co-directing, how that relationship looks like, the pros and cons to that. Um, and the first thing I wanna talk about is one of the pros about co-directing is the opportunity to essentially pass along the problem to someone else while you deal with the next problem. So while we're doing this, seven pages is a lot to shoot in one day, as we were previously saying. Um, so we constantly had to be thinking of the next thing, but there was opportunities, times where my mind was 100% fried and I could pass off the story to Zane and then he could start focusing on the next thing while my mind kind of slowly started to reset and I could start figuring out, okay, this is gonna be the next thing or film. It wasn't like I was just sitting back drinking Kool-Aid. I was constantly thinking, okay, this is gonna be the next thing. But the, the, one of the pros, the way I see it um, with co-directing is it allows opportunities to not slow down the set. Um, whereas like usually, typically in a traditional sense, everyone would say, okay, we're gonna stop for 30 minutes. We're gonna let the director figure things out. Um, we didn't have that time to stop the set because we, would, we wouldn't have been able to finish the video. Instead of stopping the set, I was able to just pass everything off to Zane while I started thinking of the next thing. And I mean, vice versa, we kept on going back and forth. So that's one of the pros to co-directing. Other pros, Zane? Yeah, so uh, and other pros, and as far as co-directing goes, there's no right or wrong way to do it. Um, you gotta figure out what works best with your co-director. And Devin and I have been working with each other for over three years now. And so we're very familiar with how we operate and, and some of our strengths and, weak, and weaknesses. So that's also super um, positive thing about co-directing is that you guys have different strengths and you can play on that. Um, and not just handing it off, but it's like, hey, cool, I know that Devin's gonna be able to handle this really well because he's done it a million times and, and he's just really good at it. Um, and vice versa. So there's, there's that. Also, another thing is, 
just bouncing off ideas. You don't have to feel like you're 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 alone and you're though everyone is depending on you. Devin and I can step away just for a little moment. We can talk and then we can go. We can come to a conclusion saying, "Oh, this is the coolest idea." Because we'll say, "Idea, idea, idea, idea." This is not good. This is not good. But then all of a sudden we find our golden idea, and it's not like that. Devin or I are like we have to use my idea. We have to use Devin's idea. We just find the best idea, and that's what we go with. So that's another super big pro with co-directing. Now, what would you say, Zane, are some disadvantages to co-directing? Uh, disadvantages probably would be one thing is it can be a disadvantage is working with actors, and sometimes they can get overloaded with information when two directors are talking to them at the same time. But I think that Devin and I are pretty good at. For example, if Devin's directing, then I'll just come up to him and talk to him about something. So then Devin can go and relate that to the actor instead of Devin saying something, and then I jump in and say something. And I think Devin and I actually um, worked really well on that front. But I've seen that not work well when there. I've been I've been on sets where there wasn't supposed to be co-directing taking place, but it was taking place, and multiple people were talking to an actor, and I watched them get overloaded, and I actually watched the actor get upset and tell everyone to be quiet. Um, and then and then speak to the director. And I mean, one thing I would add to this, talking about the Aquabats project, um, is one of the things as far as that I deal with on a constant basis, even before Zane joined the team, is I'm used to dealing with a lot of people. Um, so more the locations or the, the scenes that we're playing out with a lot more people is usually I was kind of running and doing that show. One thing that Zane kills with as far as her, uh, narrowing down with specific actors. So this case, I knew Zane could kill it with John Heater because he's used to working one-on-one -on -one with, with actors. So I don't even know if you know, notice Zane, but a lot of times when I saw that opportunity, I would pass it off to Zane just because I knew that John was used to more traditional directors. I knew Zane could kill it as far as working one-on-one -on -one, and then that Zane would take over and kind of narrow that that in. So it's just knowing your weaknesses, your strengths, and looking for those opportunities where it makes more sense to kind of hand things off. But like Zane said, it can be really confusing for an actor if Zane's giving his input, and then let's just say I didn't hear Zane's input, then I go in and I actually tell the actor something a little bit different. It's just gonna confuse the actor that much more. So it's also being on the same page as much as you can. Uh, but generally speaking, the director should never both leave. They should both be aware of what's happening. I mean, while Zane's directing the actors, I can also be talking to the director of the photography and saying, okay, this is how we should line up the shot. And then when Zane gets there, most of the time Zane's gonna agree with me, fingers crossed. Uh, but because we were on the same page going into it, we were able to align and be on the same page. But it would be next to impossible for co-directors to come together without ever working together and making an awesome project happen. You definitely have to have that chemistry going into it and knowing how each other thinks, how each other works for it to be as successful as possible. And Zane and I, we've, we've done a big Fortnite video together where we co-directed it. Um, we work together on a constant everyday basis. So we were able to align and be on the same page before that. And even before we started filming, like the directing for this project, it didn't happen on set. It was happening a week before that where Zay and I was like, okay, let's co-direct this project together. Let's watch a ton of different Aquabat episodes. Let's read the script together multiple times and get it dialed in as far as what we can do to have this be the best story possible and use both of our strengths, understand each other's weaknesses and tell that story. So we were both aware of that going into it so it could be as successful as possible. And I think that another thing too that Devin and I do really well and why we enjoy work co-directing with each other is that we're both not prideful. So I think pride can be uh, a big enemy in filmmaking. Everyone wants to say, this is my piece of art, this is my creation, I'm in charge. But if you can check your ego at the door when you come in and uh, and just be open and two, two ideas, something that Devin and I will do is, we'll, maybe if we do have conflicting ideas about something, we'll shoot it two ways. We'll say, okay, hey, let's just shoot it this way, one, one take, and then we'll do it a different way, another take. And then we kind of just let it see, after when we get to the editing room, we'll be like, oh, you know what, this one actually worked better you know what I mean? And so just having those, just having that a lack of pride, I guess the humility to be open to other ideas is super helpful and will help you go such a long way in the filmmaking world. So going into this project with Zane and I co-directing, we wanted to be as efficient as possible because we were doing this together as a team. Um, one of our friends, Chris Romwell, he is actually the stunt double for Chris Pratt. Um, but he just got done filming with the Russo brothers, or the ones that just directed the last two Avengers movies. Uh, but we asked him, like, how do the Russo brothers, how do they co-direct, what does that look like? And one of the things that he had said is with the Russos, they both have different strengths. Anthony is more of the technical guy, and Joe is more of the actor guy. But they both switch off doing stuff because they are very in sync. Most of their decisions are made in the production meeting the day before the shoot. They are surrounded by amazing department heads who they work with 
and delegate specific things to. In those meetings, it's the best idea wins atmosphere where they have the final say. So after reading that too, and I mean, Zane and I had worked together so much, it was that, that same mentality that we wanted to try and apply to us. But I mean, that's what is happening in the real Hollywood world and just applying to what we're doing to find the most success. But the biggest thing is, is, is whatever works for that story is the best answer. What works for the Rooster Brothers might not work for someone else doing a project, you know? So there's certain people that will never direct with other people or you probably won't see it, you know? So it just depends on the project um, and the people as far as that chemistry on what's gonna make the most sense for the story. So another thing that directors, I feel like a lot of beginning directors will make the mistake is that they don't have uh, their script in front of them, they don't have a paper in front of them, they don't have a pen in hand. So you'll see a lot of times in the B-roll of this that Devin and I have uh, folder or paper or script or whatever always in our hands and we're constantly looking and checking things off. I have seen directors where they're not doing any of that and it's easy for them to get confused or miss out on, on things because a lot of times uh, like Devin said with the Russo brothers and what Devin and I did is we will discuss ideas and we have ideas like for example one of my favorite things to do is when I go through a script I go line by line and I figure out okay what is the motive of that line what is that actor trying to say and based off of that then I know okay this is how the camera should work and so I, I can set myself up and saying make sure I grab this angle make sure I grab this shot because when you get on set you're gonna be like I, like we've said before, you're gonna get bombarded with all the department heads, you're gonna to have to make a million decisions, and you're not gonna be able to think and remember all the things that you thought up before. So having those notes in front of you and being able to look at them and going, oh yeah, I, I did wanna get that. Oh yeah, that was a good idea that we came up with yesterday. So make sure that you guys have a script in hand. Even if you have a scripty on set, which we can talk about that department head in a different video, um, be sure that you guys have something in front of you at all times so that you can keep notes and you can keep track of what you're doing. Because guys, you'll be you'll you'll find out very quickly that you get overwhelmed and that you'll have a million other thoughts that you're thinking about and you won't be able to remember all the genius thoughts that you guys had before. And so make sure you have that in, in your hand. Make sure that you give yourself time to to look around, um, take a moment to breathe and recheck yourself to make sure that you got everything that you have planned to get. So let's talk about multiple camera benefits as far as the pros of having multiple cameras on set. Now, obviously it's not always gonna be an option or within the budget to have multiple cameras. In our case, we did have a bigger team. Because Zane and I were co-directed, the person that normally directs the show, he was able to act as a second cameraman on a lot of the shots. Now, we had seven pages to film in one day. Already an impossible feat um, or request, but because we had multiple cameras, it allowed us to tell the story a lot faster, especially for a lot of the scenes where it's just sitting down, it's a lot of the same kind of reaction, action shots. We were able to have two cameras going to tell that story. So multiple cameras can be extremely efficient when there is an opportunity to have two cameras on set. Now, with that being said, is they weren't two of the exact same camera models. Um, they were two completely different cameras, both Sony cameras, but we, it's not like you have to have two red cameras that are exactly the same. A lot of times, even in Hollywood, they'll use two different kind of cameras as far as the A camera is usually the most expensive camera. Um, the B camera is usually a little bit cheaper, but just know that you don't have to be using the exact same camera to tell that story if you have a multiple camera setup. Another thing to talk about is learn the language of cameras and camera angles. Uh, so for example, when we did the Aquabats, it was a little different type of shoot that Devin and I have never done before as far as be doing a kids TV show and in this kind of strange comedy realm. And so Devin and I watched several episodes of the Aquabats, became very familiar, so that way our camera movements and our camera angles would make sense as, as it goes along with comedy and, and a kids TV show and the way they film the Aquabats. Um, so for example, if you are shooting a suspense thriller, then you need to learn how to move the camera like a suspense thriller. If you're shooting an action scene, you need to learn how to move the camera like an action scene. It really is becoming familiar with those things and studying that before you get on set. Also, it helps to have a d director of photography who's very familiar with that as well, because then they'll be like, uh, both Jason and um, Jeff, they would move the camera or they set the camera maybe in a Dutch angle or something else like that that Devin and I wouldn't have done. But they're like, hey, this is the way we do the show. So it kind of opened our minds to the language of their show and how the camera moves and, and all that stuff. But that is super important into telling your story is learn the language of camera movement and camera angles. Which brings us to our next thing. So generally speaking on most film shoots as far as, far as narrative stuff goes is you'll usually start with a wide shot 
then all of a sudden you'll go to a medium shot and then a really tight shot on your actors. So even with what we were filming, and they even gave us a heads up as far as these actors, they usually start getting the feel for the lines as you start progressing, and then the takes actually get better. So we were always starting with the wide shot where you're not seeing their performances really close up, where they don't have to be perfect, but you want them to be perfect once we have rehearsed it and done it a bunch of times when we're really close. But it is very important to know know who your actors are because there are a lot of actors as well on the opposite side of that where they always give their best performances at the start and as they keep on repeating it it just becomes kind of like they get sick and tired of doing the same performance so you're actually losing the performance there even in the real hollywood world even these directors will say like this act that they start losing the magic of their takes as they keep on doing it so it's also being aware of the actors that you're working with because in those cases you're going to want to start with a tight shot and then slowly work your way out to a wide shot so once again is just knowing your actors and being adaptive to the situation. That wide shot is super important. Um, that's often called the safety shot. You just let the whole scene take place out in that wide shot. And what that will allow you to do is just help with your pacing in the editing room. And so let's say that all of a sudden your tight shots didn't cut well together. Well, you have that wide to pull out, like Devin said, where you don't see a lot of the intricacies of the performance or the facial expressions or whatever that may be. And so it allows that illusion to continue to take place that it's all flowing together because you have that master wide shot. And I have been and seen many times in beginning filmmaking or films where they forget to get that wide shot. And, uh, and then all of a sudden they're trying to have to cut tight shots in together and then continuity is pretty rough. So get that wide safety shot. Now the next thing we're gonna talk about is music. So this was the first set I've ever been on where after every take, someone would turn on the music full blast. It could be anything from pop music to old school 70s time of your life music. Um, and that could be a really good thing, but also a really bad thing. So it's also knowing the entire set etiquette as far as what's okay, what's not okay. In this case, this was a Kickstarter project where most of the people there were doing it for very little pay, if not any pay. Um, so the best thing for that is to make sure everyone's having an incredible experience because that's gonna be a payoff for a lot of these people. If we're just essentially cracking the rip, just making everyone kind of super work, people are gonna get exhausted and not be happy to be there. But they were playing the music and it was making people dancing and having fun, so it relaxed the set. Um, so that was the pro of it. Now the con of it was, yeah, what's name? Yeah, the con of it was that Devin and I, you know, were trying to cram in all these shots because the reason that we only had I mean, we had, to, we had to do not just seven pages in a day, but seven pages with daylight. And we had to start later because there was heavy shadows, and so Devin and I, we had everything organized to how much time we had, but that uh, started going away because we figured out we had to start later because there was massive shadows that were covering the, the crowd at the beginning. And we had to shoot the crowd at the beginning because that's when all the extras were there. And, um, but what happened was, is that, yeah, it's great. The, the set had this, this great uh, feeling because they'd play the music, but then Devin and I would be thinking, we had to be like, okay, we have to get these five shots off now and fast. Then also the music would go on and your, your mind would go blank. And you were just, we would be stressed out and we'd be like, oh my gosh, like we want to let them have fun because it maintains that, um, that feeling on set, which we, which we super valued. But at the same time, there's so many times where Devin and I like, just turn off the music. We can't concentrate, we can't think. Um, and then there was times where we were trying to shout out the actors and tell them to come back and because we just wanted to film right away because we needed to get two more takes of that same, you know, scene. And so dealing with that was kind of a challenge, but I think Devin and I both realized that what they were doing was um, really good and, pro and, and much needed on, this, on that type of set. But man, was it a challenge and man, was it pretty hard and annoying to maintain a, um, a positive attitude instead of just telling them just to turn off the music and not do it again. Because it was like every time. And sometimes it was seriously like we'd say cut and then they'd be like ready to play the music right away and then we were like, okay, we're filming right away and then they'd have to struggle to turn it off again and we're just like, you know you can just keep the music off and we would get through this a lot faster. So it was just interesting to see that type of um, environment on set. Uh, it's something that we weren't ever used to, but it was also cool because it did help all the actors maintain a positive attitude. Another big thing when working on a set that you don't know anyone there is whatever you can do to bring at least one person on set that knows the way you work. That way you have someone that believes in you and that helps your confidence, but also helps get more people on board. So in this case, first time working with all these people, so I had Zane there next to me to help build my confidence, but also to show other people that someone else had confidence in me. So even when we first got there on set, 
like I mean, everyone was so willing and, and um, stoked that we were there, but it took a couple hours to gain everyone's trust there. That's gonna be the problem with any set you work on if it's your first time working with those people because these people are used to having the exact same director, exact same producer. Now you've got the new guy on set and now all of a sudden he's telling everyone what to do. But after a couple hours of them seeing, okay, they actually came prepared, they know what they're doing, um, then we could start feeling that much more as far as they were a lot more hands off as far as just completely trusting us. And then you see a lot of these like producers and stuff kind of taking a big step back because we had proven ourselves within those first couple hours. So just know like first impressions are everything. You only have a couple hours to impress people. And then once you have that though, everything runs so much smoother as far as they take your ideas more seriously. They're open to new ideas and then they let you run with it and have fun with it. So it was just fun kind of seeing that change as the day progressed. And by the end of the day, it was like, whatever you guys think, go for it. So that was fun and exciting to see. Another big department on set and I feel like is the most ill-treated on set is the audio. Um, these guys who are trying to capture the audio with their booms and mics and setting up lobs and all that other stuff, you'll see that there's kind of this stigma or this, this idea that audio guys are treated pretty poorly. But what I have found in my own experiences on set is if you treat them importantly and, and, and really just give them the respect that they deserve, like. Uh, help them get people quiet because when audio guys are shouting quiet, I've seen so many times where people just don't listen to them and tell like the director or the first AD is shouting for them to be quiet. But really being in tune with them and listening to them because uh, and kind of um, being proactive because you'll you'll see their expressions when all of a sudden they're hearing a sound and they maybe feel uncomfortable about calling cut. Is that you, make sure you get their approval. Go go to them and say, hey, did you get what you needed? You know, and they'll tell you right away, and they will respect you so much. And and having that guys because. A lot of people forget, but I, I feel like one of the biggest differences between an amateur production and a really professional production is the quality of the audio. So respect your audio guys, and they will respect you, and you're gonna get the best of the best. So there's just something to, to think about when you get on set, make sure that you, you, keep, you give those guys the attention that they, that they deserve. All right, so another piece of advice from experience is really be there for your actors. Watch out for them, take care of them. So we had two big costumes. Um, one was the Mauler, which was the main villain. It was this giant like foam thing that this guy had to fit into and be in it all day. And another one was the Invisible Man, which was played by John Heater. And he was in a trench coat, ski mask, um, huge socks, like completely covered up because you couldn't see any of his skin. He had gloves on. And it was not a cool day. It was pretty hot. And so um, it's easy to get bombarded or keep, stay focused about the set, you know what I mean, and, and the story and all those other things you have to deal with as a director. But I think a huge part is, and I did it almost annoyingly, but afterwards John came up and actually thanked me, was I constantly was asking how he was doing and making sure he was okay and that he didn't need a break. I did the same thing um, with, the, with the actor who played the Mahler, and I was constantly asking him if he was okay, making sure that the PAs were on it and giving them water, making sure that they were getting the right amount of breaks. But take care of your actors. Uh, like I said, it's so easy to forget and I've seen actors mistreated. And it, and it is so frustrating. It's not necessarily on purpose, it's just that because everyone's dealing with so much already that the actors kind of get forgotten about. But as a director, your relationship, your main relationship should be with the actors because they are the ones helping you tell the story. They are the ones who are um, making this movie possible. And so making sure that they're happy is gonna be a better performance. They're gonna wanna work with you again. They're gonna remember you because you took care of them. So take care of your actors. Make sure that they are okay at all times, especially when they are in hot costumes or uncomfortable situations. Um, whatever that may be, take care of your actors. We want to hear a speech. We all go to heck. <laughs> now we're gonna talk about being nice and being efficient. Now we had a great first AD on set, first assistant director is what that stands for, AD. Um, they're the ones that essentially run the set as far as they're like the, the commander that's telling them, okay, you go here, you go there. But also as a director, a lot of times you also have to take on that role or that mantle. And one of the things that we saw, one of the biggest things that slowed us down is right after every take as Zane was saying earlier, is everyone wanted to play music, jam out, just hang out and kind of laugh and, and talk. But us as the storytellers in charge of the whole story is we'd have to essentially crack that whip. Now, if we just act like this ruthless dictators, people aren't gonna be happy to be there. So it's also understanding the people that we're working with. So we'd always have to have, okay, everyone, we gotta slow down, we gotta stop what we're doing, and we gotta get serious about this. So we would approach that in different ways. Christian, he was the main lead singer of the Aquabats. He was one of the people that was always playing the music right after every take. And instead of me saying, hey, Christian, turn off that music, I would say, hey, Christian, 
And then he'd look at me and I was like, keep up the good work. And he'd give me a big smile, but he would instantly know that that was like a nice way of saying, Christian, turn off your music, let's start filming again. So, and it also, it didn't make him look stupid on set. I was like actually giving him a compliment on set. So it's just knowing who you're dealing with. But you do have to know when you're gonna be their, their best friend, but also when you're gonna be their leader. And a lot of times leaders aren't always favored, but if you can be a good leader while also being favored, that's that much better. Um, Zane had a really cool story he was sharing right before this about babies. I'm gonna have Zane kind of share that story. Yeah, so one of my mentors when I was going to school, um, he is often the first AD in a lot of projects that are locally shot and everyone loves him. Now the first AD is one of the main guys, like Devin said, who cracks the whip. Um, the director does as well, but he gets people to be quiet and, and, and tell them to shut up. Now there's some first ADs and they are scary. And people are actually scared of them. And so they listen to him because out of fear. But what I really loved was this, this guy, he, uh, his name is Bob Condor. Love him, he's awesome, awesome person to work with. His whole thing was he would say, is, hey, he would go up to people and he'd be like, shh, you're gonna wake the baby. And so there was no baby on set, but he said you'd be, people would be so quick to be like, oh, I'm so sorry, and they'd be quiet. And then they'd be like, wait a minute, there's no baby. <laughs> and so he was come up with creative ways like Devin did of saying, hey, you know, you're doing a good job, where they get the idea of what you're saying and you don't have to be mean about it. Now, I know that there's some days when they're, they're grueling and they're long hours and that you might have been shooting, you know, all day the day before, you know, you might be sunburned, you might not feel very good as the first AD, but still try to maintain that creativity of talking with people nicely, but also getting work done. The entire energy of a set is usually gonna be portrayed by the director and then that works its way down to department heads, to the actors, to all the actors out there. So as far as the role of a director on any project, whether it be big or small, so much of that energy and the vibe of that set has to do with the director. So just knowing you're going into it and the way you're portraying yourself and everything else there, as far as the story goes, a lot of that is on your shoulders. And that's why it's so important to also choose the right people to be there working with you side by side because that's gonna rub off on everyone else. Even on our projects where we are constantly filming, not necessarily narrative storytelling, but more like the action adventure, we're always having the other people that we're working with full of life and bringing out the best in people because it does make such a big difference on how the video feels, the vibe of the video, because that's stuff that you can only act so much. But if there's not a good feeling on set, like most of the time people are gonna read through that and see that. So it's just creating that awesome experience for everyone and that makes the story that much more powerful. So final last words, any final last words, Zane? Um, don't be afraid, don't be overwhelmed, just go and do it. And the only way you're gonna get experience is by doing it. Um, the only way people are gonna trust you and, and respect you is by doing it, it's having stuff under your belt. So get out there and make stuff happen. And just know the more you do it, the bigger your reputation builds with those same people. So if Zane and I ever get invited to do another episode of Aquabats, which they already said they would love to have us, yes. Um, but no, we know like going into it that they're gonna be that much more willing to accept our ideas because we've already proven ourselves. So a lot of filmmaking is proving it, proving that you're capable of it and then those opportunities keep on coming and keep on coming. So yes, be terrified of it because that what makes it exciting. That's what pushes yourself. But no, once you get there on set, most of that fear goes away. Even this Aquabat thing, like I was terrified going into it because like, oh no, we got to deal with John Heater. We got to deal with the Aquabats who are like my childhood growing up. So I went into it as like, this is one of the projects I'm most scared of over the last year. But after that end of that day, and once we showed up on set, like all the stars aligned and everything actually ran really smoothly. So it was just cool seeing that the more pre-production you can do, the more successful you will be as a director, as a storyteller, as a filmmaker. So there you have it. Thanks so much for listening. Over and out.